I have a song I love to sing since I have been redeemed of my Redeemer, Savior, King, since I have been redeemed. Good morning and welcome back to Bible Talks. I'm Chris Kramer with the Northside Church of Christ in Russellville, Kentucky. We invite you to worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock and Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock. You can find us at 689 North Main Street in Russellville. And as I always say, if you're familiar with Russellville, you know where Kentucky Fried Chicken is. Our building is located right next door. So come down, be with us. Let's study God's word together. Give praise, honor, and glory to his name. We'd love to talk to you and reach out to us. Uh, Northside Church of Christ at hotmail.com is our email address. So you can send us any notes or questions or comments regarding this program or any other Bible question that you might have. Uh, I've got one more lesson to cover in a series I started a couple of weeks ago on demon possession. So I'd like to finish up some thoughts with that, share some Bible passages with you that you can uh, you know, take with you to further study this subject. And of course, we can't talk about everything within the short amount of period that we have here, but uh, please reach out to me and I'll be glad to have an honest Bible discussion with you about these subjects. So go to the internet. You can find our website. Just look up Northside Church of Christ, Russellville, Kentucky on any search engine like Google or Yahoo. Our website will be right there. It'll pop right up and you can find links to our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, and other resources that you can use in your studies of God's word. And you can get to know a little bit more about us as well. As I pointed out, uh, Nick Greenman can't be with me. He has spent the past few weeks uh, working hard, um, helping with the election polls in the area that he's in, uh, as well as maintaining his duties as the uh, gospel preacher at the uh, Christian Home Congregation in Morgantown, Kentucky. So if you happen to be up in that area, go by and see Nick. I know he'd love to see you. I want to thank him for the work that he's doing uh, in our communities uh, at such an important time uh, in our, um, in our you know, country's uh, history. So we will hopefully, if all goes well, be back together next week to continue our studies in the overview of books of the Bible. All right, let's get into our study today as we answer questions about demon possession. This will be part three. So I'm going to try, if I can, not to repeat myself too much uh, from the past two lessons that we have had. And I want to get right to the point of this lesson, which means I won't be able to bring you up to date with some of the things. If you haven't seen or heard the last two lessons, please go to the YouTube channel and uh, Northside Church of Christ, Russellville, Kentucky, and, and, and rewatch those. Uh, they're more of inter introductory thoughts uh, in regard to demon possession, you know, what people think about it, where, you know, the, the thinking of it comes from. But today I want to finish up the study by giving us hope as we look in what the Bible has to say. And I left off here last week with 1 John chapter 4, and verse 4, where as Christians, uh, we need to be encouraged that God has given us the victory. You know, that is the, you know, that's a song that we sing. Faith is the victory. And what we have as Christians is the fact that demons cannot possess God's people. Um, no matter the fact that it is not a practice today, but even in the first century, you don't have examples of God's people being possessed by demons. They never had any effect on the Christians uh, that were faithful to him, certainly not the apostles. And uh, even though they had knowledge of these individuals, you would think that if a demon had that much power that he would try to overcome even Jesus, try to overcome uh, the apostles and what they were doing, try to thwart uh, their teachings. Uh, but that just wasn't the case. And so in 1 John 4 and verse 4, he says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So the question might come up, can the devil have power over me? I know a lot of people, as I pointed out in the past two lessons, get caught up with certain things in life, and they want a reason as to why. Uh, sometimes, rather than looking at ourselves or our own situations, we want to blame an outside force. We might want to blame Satan, maybe uh, for the wrongs that we do, maybe for the situations that we're in. We talked about many different aspects of that, whether it's physical health, mental health, many other things. Um, you, you may hear a little raspiness in my voice today. I've, I've been dealing with COVID for two weeks. 
Some would say, oh, that's a demon. <laughs> it's not a demon. It's COVID. You know, <laughs> we should know, you know, the difference between sickness and things that are sometimes beyond our control. But the devil doesn't have any power over you. And the thing that I love from the very beginning of, of the Bible is that uh, all Satan could do with Eve is make a suggestion. Unfortunately, she listened to the lies that the devil had said. The devil is the father of lies. And even though we have a few examples here and there of the physical, um, you know, uh, things that the devil would bring upon some, Job is a good example. He, he lost much physically. He suffered much physically. Uh, again, we, we cannot look across the board at some of the exceptions that we find throughout the Bible and say, that's still a thing for us today. Jesus, if we do so, then what's happened is that Jesus hasn't really done his work. And I would never proclaim that. But in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it kind of comes back to what God says we are going to face, even as Christians and as the temptations of sin. Look at what he says. No temptation is overtaking you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So we're not talking about possession. We're talking about influence. We're talking about the power of suggestion. It happens to us every day. We listen to advertisements on TV, the radio. We see what's happening in the news or in our world, and we find situations that influence our thinking. It influences our decisions. Uh, in the recent political race, you'll find that candidates were still um, <clears throat> out there trying to influence people to vote for them uh, in, in the hopes that maybe somehow they could say something or do something that might change a person's mind before they went into that, uh, you know, election uh, place to cast their ballot. Um, you know, that's the way we approach things as people. We want to encourage people, influence them. Uh, show that the way that we are trying to encourage them to do is a better way. And that's certainly what we're trying to do as Christians. But remember that he's talking about things here that are common to man. I, I feel like as Christians, sometimes we feel more of a burden of the you know powers of Satan and the things that we see in the world. I feel that sometimes since Satan has the world in his pocket, you might say that his attention is going toward the Christians. Um, then whether or not that's right or not, what I do think is that we are all, um, you know, fallible. We are all, uh, you know, in the danger of subjecting ourselves to the temptations that take us away from God. But with God in our lives, he makes the way of escape. With God in our lives, he helps us to make choices that we should know inherently are were the wrong, you know, go against the wrong choices we shouldn't be making. In other words, who wants to live in sin? I know there are many people in the world that have convinced themselves that their sinful lifestyles are what they want and the things that bring them joy. But I think as they get older and hopefully more mature, they start seeing, no, I see more now the influence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I see this in people, especially as they get older. I've seen it in recent political figures who have taken more of a stand for God in their lives. Uh, you see it all the time when people experience things in life and start to realize, I need to humble myself before him. And so hopefully we become better and more informed people as time goes on by letting God uh, you know, lead us in our lives. But how does that happen? Again, it gets back to what God has given us, and that is a sense of self-control. Uh, the question is, is serving a demon beyond my control? Well, 1 Corinthians 10, 20 through 21 says, Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. Isn't that funny? That a lot of the things that people claim are beyond their control, God somewhere in the Bible says, don't do this. Why would God tell us not to do a thing? Why would God tell us not to do a thing if it were not within our control? I think a lot of times we might look at our own lives as children and look back at the times that we were told not to do a thing. And maybe we did it anyway. 
and um, you know, got in trouble for those things. I've heard people say, well, why does a parent let their child do that? And I would say, well, they didn't let their child do that. They told them not to. They, the child disobeyed. As adults, we look at God and his place in the world today. And this is a question that comes up quite often. Why does God let certain things happen? And my standard answer to that is he doesn't let sin happen. He told you not to do it. Obey him. And that's the problem with people. They want God. Again, they want to get back to the miraculous aspect of God controlling everything. Yet if God were to control everything, they wouldn't be happy with that either because nobody wants to be told what to do, right? The whole mantra of the world is I want control over my own life, my own body. They, you know, they don't want to believe in God no matter how he served up to people. But he says, I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. I'll just say this. Um, it's more of a meme that has been going around lately. And even though I'm not here to get political about things, it's, it's certainly one of those points that, you know, you can't conscientiously agree and vote for and uh, subject yourself to uh, abortion. And yet, show up in church on Sunday and talk about how much you love God. That's inconsistent. That's hypocritical. And it sickens me that people that want to live that way would even evoke the name of God or Jesus Christ as though they support, uh, you know, the horrible uh, act of taking the life of an innocent child. But um, I won't get on a soapbox for that today. But I think it's very important that we look at whose side we need to be on when it comes to uh, the choices that God allows us to make. Serving a demon beyond my control. Well, first Timothy four and verse one. Again, this is Paul, the apostle speaking to Timothy, says now the spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Again, I think it's interesting here that the focus on spirits and demons is about the deceiving and the doctrines. It's not about possession. It's not about making you do things beyond your own reasonable mind telling you, I shouldn't do this thing. It's not about giving, uh, you know, into temptation and blaming Satan that you couldn't help yourself. To give heed is to follow and obey of one's own free will. So this demon stuff isn't beyond anyone's control. And if we give heed to the doctrines of spirits and demons, in other words, you know, what's the, what's the devil telling you exactly? And you look at the opposite of that in God's word, then you know that it's not of God. It's just exactly what the devil started with from the very beginning. When God said, you eat of this tree, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. And Satan's words were, you will not surely die. You know, take a bite, see for yourself. And so he's always trying to tempt us to, you know, push the envelope of our relationship with God. Again, just like a child, they, they test us. They test us as to how far they can get away with something. And then if you let them, they keep doing it over and over again. Be careful when you laugh at a child's, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, pushing the envelope with you. Uh, sometimes we might think it's cute. There's been many times, uh, uh, whether it's my own children or grandchildren who have done things in their youth, in their own ignorance, um, that was kind of funny. But you have to turn your head and laugh. <laughs> and you can't support, you know, the, the wrong things that they do. And I'm not talking about sinful things, mind you. I'm just talking about things of, of character you know, things that we want to teach them. And uh, certainly when they get into sinful things later in life, we, we want to address that a little more sharply. But we have that power over Satan. And we cannot be pushing the envelope with God and seeing just how far, because we, God is a merciful God. And just look at your own life. I can certainly speak for myself, but look at your own life and say, you know what? God has let me get away with a whole lot more than I ever should have. And, and I wouldn't say that he's letting us get away with it. So don't misunderstand my words, but because we have a merciful God doesn't mean that we get away with sin, but he is patient. And we do have 
time to make things right with him. Because at some point, we'll, we, we will be judged. Maybe what we've been doing all of our lives, we, we haven't felt like we've been judged up to this point. But we will be judged. That day will come. And um, you won't get away with it. So that's that's something to think about. Another thing to consider, too, is 1 Corinthians 4, 32 through 33. And uh, it's important to note in, in regard to the lessons on the Holy Spirit, which I've done in other series. And if you would like access to those things, um, I can certainly send you the links to the YouTube channels. Uh, they're on another program. But he says the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Again, no matter, and this is even talking about, you know, the godly things, um, the spiritual nature of how the Holy Spirit worked in the first century of allowing men to speak in tongues and to interpret and to prophesy and, and to heal even many things um, of which I believe came to an end uh, after the apostles uh, passed on and after the word was completed in its written form. But he says the God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So you see, even the Christian, the individual Christian could control the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the first century. The Christian could deny those gifts. Again, people want to, you know, put upon God that he is just controlling us. Uh, and a lot of religious people think that, you know, in a good way. Oh, yeah, I've, I felt the spirit. In other words, I felt the tingling. I felt a, a pull. I felt a motivation. Whatever it might be, they want to talk about things that went beyond their control. I don't believe God has ever enacted that way. He's never put upon somebody, even something good, something that man has within his own ability to choose. Uh, he never forced anyone's obedience. He never forced anyone's obedience. Uh, sometimes, you know, from a human standpoint, I, I might wish that was the case. I wish he would just yank me into heaven and make me a good person, regardless of the choices I make in this life. But that's not the way it is. It's a Calvinistic view that we need to be careful of because we're attributing something to God that he places the responsibility on us. He's done his part through his son, Jesus Christ. And even in the miraculous nature of 1 Corinthians 14, in looking at how these things were done, people that claim these works can be done today, they don't even do them like 1 Corinthians 14. They deny scripture. And the spirit will never cause you to deny scripture. Okay. So there's a lying spirit that many religious people claim to have as well. But as I've said, that's a different subject on the Holy Spirit. But you connect these with demon, you know, excuses as well. And, and I've already addressed this a bit, and I want to cover it once again just real quickly. Did demon possession excuse responsibility towards sin? Romans 6 and verse 16 says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? It's our choice. It's a fancy way of saying our choice. You have a choice. Who are you going to obey? All right. A couple other questions then before we wrap up our program today. Is there demon or spiritual possession today? Uh, some of you all have to talk to personally about this because I know that when it comes to quoting Bible verses, some people would rather look at their experiences in life and put those above the Bible. That in and of itself is a danger and a blasphemy to God. If so, if there's demon or spiritual possession today, then there would be a need for miracles to in order to cast those things out. Besides, how, how's that done? And again, you have people even in this community that will tell you, well, this is how it's done. You know, we, we use holy water. What's that? That's not a biblical thing. Is it a special prayer or chant? I mean, what is it? Is it raising your right hand up in the air and offering a special prayer for God? Again, where are the examples of these things in Scripture? Nobody actually does any of these things today in the, the form that you see them in Scripture, and certainly not by the authority of which they were done in Scripture by Jesus and his apostles. Number two, if so, then a person's choice to obey the Bible and resist the devil be taken away. 
I've already said this would promote a Calvinistic view. We have a choice. Everyone, it, it, it's within your power to obey God. And I think that that's so important. And I think that's a, a good thing that people should take comfort in of knowing that nothing can control you. You don't want that anyway. <laughs> so be glad that God has given you a choice to look at his Bible and say, I want to do that. I want to follow God. It's not a matter of pride, but, you know, be glad for the fact that our light can shine in this world, that God may be given glory. And of course, I mentioned already the belief of demon possession is stoked by movies, books from men's imagination. You need to ask yourself where you're getting your information on this particular subject. In John 12, 31 through 32, the scripture says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, draw all peoples to myself. Jesus came to give his life so that we could overcome that kind of thing. Was there demon possession at one time? Yes. Is there today? I believe the answer is a resounding no. The devil cannot take Christ away from you. He cannot thwart what God had always intended for man. We live in an age and a period in these latter days where Jesus Christ is our Savior, according to his gospel in the New Testament teachings. And there's a lot of other passages that I don't have time to read because we're almost out of time. But look up Zechariah 13, 1 through 4. All these things were prophesied that there will come a time that these things won't be happening. Um, there's things about demons and, you know, their own salvation. Can they return to God? You know, the demons believe, but they tremble. The belief only salvation tactics that people try to use today kind of go against that particular idea as well. Acts 19. You've got some examples here where evil spirits, they knew about Jesus. They knew about the apostles, yet they were not saved. Is the devil present today? Well, these are some warnings that we have. First Peter 5 and verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And again, how's that done? Look at what you see out in the world today. Men are the tools that God or that the devil uses to be influenced through the temptations of sin, sexual immorality, drugs, whatever it might be. These are the very things that people want to blame Satan for, yet they have the power to say no. So I'll leave you with this. Can the devil have power over you? What does James 4 and verse 7 say? Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's your choice. Will you submit to God? And if you do so, the devil won't even have an influence on you. Oh, yeah. He's still going to be out there trying to tempt you and cause you to do things you don't want to do. But you've got God on your side. You've got his word to guide you. And you've got his people like us who are willing to help you and be accountable to God and have a wonderful home in heaven with him someday. And your life can be good along the way. But there's probably a lot more that we could say about this subject, but we're going to end it there. I want to encourage you to come and worship with us, and let's give praise to our God who protects us from that spiritual realm. But to give us a home in the spiritual realm where all tears will be wiped away. Tomorrow we're going to begin a series at Northside on heaven, and I hope that you'll come and be a part of that. And let's talk about what the Bible teaches us about heaven. Well, thank you for joining me today. And we look forward to seeing you next time on Bible Talks. Since I have been redeemed, sinners, I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in his name. Since I have been redeemed, sinners, I have been redeemed. I will glory in my Savior's name.